All right, so we're in Psalm 23. Um, do you guys know that one? You know it? We're going to read it every week. How many weeks have we? Well, we're in week five, I know. It would be highly responsible if I didn't know where we were. We're in week five, part five of Psalm 23. So if this is your first time, yeah, it's a deep dive, a deep dive. So I'm going to read it again, and by the end of this, we'll have it memorized. Well, I don't know. Actually, I start reading this, and then I quote other versions that I know, so I'm actually making up this version. This is the Nathan version that I read aloud because I'm half making it up as I go because I just can't say some of these words um, because I don't like them. Um, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. See, it says I lack nothing in my Bible. I just can't bring myself to say that. Uh, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He guides me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup of overflows. Surely your goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Um, so uh, we've been looking at uh, this. Uh, it's actually a book um, called A Shepherd's Look at uh, Psalm 23. Um, and uh, before we, this week we're going to look at You Prepare a Table Before Me. But before we go into it, I want to recap last week because the two lines kind of go hand in hand. So last week we talked about, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. So this line goes hand in hand with you prepare a table before me. Because um, if you remember last week, we were talking about the sheep traveling through the valleys, which can be full of danger, and they're on their way somewhere. They're on their way to the high ranges where the grazing is good. In those verses, we were talking about God as our protector. Um, and this next line about setting a table before me is talking about God as our provider, but also keeps with the theme, as you will see, of God as our protector because he provides protection. And I'll show you how as we go along. So these two verses go hand in hand, showing that he is our protector and our provider. And if I could think of it, another P word, but all I got is protector and provider. Um, Now, most of us, um, and I'm not saying this is wrong. We're going to talk about uh, both different uh, looks at this. But I know I always picture this. You prepare a table before me. Well, first of all, when I was a kid, a kid, I always thought that was awesome because I didn't have to set the table. God was setting the table. And so you could look at this like, awesome, I don't have to work, right? God is setting the table. He's preparing a meal. And we picture this physical table that God is setting. And the best part is in the presence of my enemies, right? So you're like, man, I'm sitting here feasting on a meal, right? And my enemy is sitting on the ground watching, right? And, and I think we kind of make it like, that's awesome. This is my favorite Bible verse. You know, when we take a a bite of that big turkey leg, or if you're at Disney, it's emu, but they sell it like turkey. That's why it's got that weird consistency. Um, And you're like, oh, mm, mm, this is so good. Are you hungry, enemy? Because I'm not. Right? That's how we picture it. Um, But I always found it strange that David, he's using this like shepherd sheep analogy the whole time. And then all of a sudden, he's talking about a table, and all of a sudden, we're like humans again. And so the original word implies a meal. It's a meal that is spread out um, over over a a big area. Um, And you can look at this like, yeah, a meal spread out on the table, like in a banquet. But also, using the sheep-shepherd analogy, um, it's spread out like tablelands or, or mesas. Mesa is actually, uh, it's actually an African word uh, for table, and the Spanish got it uh, from them. So um, we're going to look at the table as a table land or a, or a mesa and actually have a picture, surprisingly enough. I have some pictures this time. Um, and this is a picture of table lands or a table um, in terms of, isn't that beautiful? Yeah. Don't you just want to like be at the top? Not walk up it, but just appear at the top and look, and then a helicopter takes you back. Um, I tried to get a picture, maybe. It looks like there should be Numenorean kings blocking the way, right? Anybody? One, two people? You know what I'm talking about. Yeah, right. Fellowship of the Ring, part one. Um, 
so the author, um, sorry, that's like everything, of, everything revolves around that. Um, so the author, not really, it revolves around the Bible. <laughs> don't, don't, don't quote that. So the author of A Shepherd's Look at Psalm 23, um, he believes David is referring to these tables or mesas in the high summer range where the eating is good, where it's like the mountaintop and there's just green everywhere. And I know grass isn't like appealing to us as food, but for sheep, it's like, oh man, it, it, there's a spread out meal before us. The table is the top of the mountain, the tablelands, beyond the valley of the shadow of death. And these tables, I mean, it looks remote and it looks difficult to get to, right? Difficult to reach. But the good shepherd will take the time and trouble to ready them for the arrival of the flock. Even though these are wild lands, he goes ahead to prepare this table for the arrival of the flock. So it's not like he's preparing just a dinner table. He's preparing a a mountain. He's preparing a mountain, an entire mountain for the arrival of the flock. And in one sense, right, when we do reach the end of our journey, right, the, the final banquet, the, the, the wedding party, when we reach the final table lands, he's told us that he is preparing a place for us. In John 14, 2 through 6, it says, In my Father's house are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you, because I'm going there to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back again, and I will take you to myself, so that where I am, you may be also." And to the place where I'm going, you know the way. And Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going, so how can we know the way? And Jesus said to him, I am, I'm going to read this amplified, I am the only way to God and the real truth and the real life. So he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. And I'm going to make sure, because we could have just pointed out that it means he's preparing a place for us, but I want to point that out. He says, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. No man comes to the Father but through me. And I think that's important, especially for the times that we live in, because people talk about, oh, there's just like, there's so many different ways. There's so many different paths to God, right? And if you notice any other religion that acknowledges Jesus, because they don't really know what to do with him, They'll like acknowledge him as a great prophet, but then at the same time saying he's a liar. But he's a great prophet, great man, liar, right? But they always, it's always the person that they discount is Jesus, which is important because Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father but through me. He says that. So, so as Christians, or as anybody, he says, I am the way. I am the only way. No one comes but through me. So isn't it a beautiful trick of the devil to have, oh, these things are good. This is good. This is good. You don't need, you don't need Jesus. There's all these similarities, but you don't need Jesus. You can live this way, live by the golden rule, but you don't need Jesus. Where Jesus says, I am the only way. There's one way. So in this sense, we could actually look at, back at this phrase through the valley of the shadow of death. When we look at this uh, final banquet, when we reach the table lands with God uh, for the final time, when, it, when, when we look back at this phrase through the valley of the shadow of death, this gives a whole new meaning with a different element because Jesus' blood took, the sting of, took away the sting of death So for those who keep with the shepherds. So death is but a shadow of itself. It holds no power. So we're going through the valley of the shadow of death. Not the valley of death, just the shadow of death. Because with the shepherd, his blood has taken away the power of death. So it's but a shadow of its former self. And with the shepherd and the shepherd alone, we walk through the valley of the shadow of death to the final table that he has prepared for us. But that's the final table, because we all know if we look at this in terms of our life's journey, right, because usually when we're giving analogies, like mountaintops are like, man, I'm on the mountaintop, things are great, right? Or like when I'm in the valley, things are are awful. Um, And that's kind of how we describe it, which like in real life, I mean, I kind of like valleys, you know, not of the shadow of death, but like of the sunshine and the creeks and, you know, but let's not get confused. So, uh, So we have smaller versions of this in earth. Right? Smaller versions, like we, we go through the valleys, we go to the mountaintops, we go through the valleys, we have ups and downs. And so we're going to kind of look at it 
through that. Not the final table land, but just like the journey through life, okay? So early in the season, before all the snow has melted, the shepherd will make preliminary trips to the mountaintops to survey this wild country. He walks the land and looks it over with great attention to detail, great attention to detail. He's not just walking and whistling. He's looking. He's looking over the land. And he does this numerous times, and he does it again right before he's about to bring the sheep up. He does it again and makes one more trip over the land looking and searching. And while, while he does this on this last trip, he'll take a supply of salts and minerals uh, to distribute over the range in strategic spots that will benefit the sheep. Um, and these are not light. They're not light. It's like basically carrying a bunch of rocks up a mountain and spreading them out in different areas. And, and it's through rough terrain. It's not just like this beautiful slope that you can just walk up and not sweat, right? And he goes over the range. He looks like, where can we camp? What's a good grazing spot? We can stay here for a little bit. We can stay here for a long time. He's just constantly looking over to plan out what he's going to do with the sheep when they're there. Um, he determines how good the grass is and the vegetation uh, to pick the only, uh, the only route they're going to take. Um, so not only does he lead us and prepare a way through the bad times, but he's also continuing to lead us in the good on the mountaintops. He's prepared the mountaintop for us. But often these are the times when we might, may not be as attentive, right? When we're on the mountaintop, we may not be as attentive because it looks beautiful and it feels safe. I've had someone um, tell me, you know, they got, they got the job they wanted. They've been like waiting for their, on their life. They, their whole life got this job and um, they're like, oh man, that's awesome. I'm gonna be praying for you. And they were like, I don't need prayer. No, I don't need prayer. I've made it. I'm here. And, um, and sure enough, something happened, you know? And, um, and like any good Christian, you go and full of grace, you say, I told you so. No, I'm just kidding. Um, but, but it was like, man, but it was kind of when I, when, I, when I heard that, heard that I don't need prayer, I've made it. It was like, man, you don't understand. As Christians, we need to understand the mountaintop still has some dangers, right? Notice he mentions enemies, right? He prepares a table for us in the presence of our enemies. So when the shepherd is going over the land, like besides bringing like supplies of salts and stuff, he's looking for things that are dangerous to the flock. And these include a number of things, but one thing he checks for is poisonous plants. And there is a plant, uh, there's a flower, actually it's called the kamas, and there are two different versions of this flower, there's a blue one and a white one. Um, and you can, this is the blue one. Um, the person who named it is blind because it's purple. Um, and this is the white one. And if you, you can even see that it has hints of the same color. You might almost think this is the same flower, just it's like early in bloom or later in bloom. It hasn't got its full color or it's lost its full color. And go back to the other one again. Like look at it and see how very similar these flowers are. They look the same. But one of these is deadly poisonous for a sheep. If they take one bite of this, and which one is it? It's the white one, just so you know. If you're ever lost in the woods and you see a white one, don't eat it. Okay? So the white one is poisonous. If, if, if a sheep uh, eats this, it will quickly paralyze them. And they stiffen up like a block of wood and die from the toxin shortly after. And isn't it funny how something so bad for us can look almost identical to something that is not harmful. They're both beautiful. One of them can be eaten. One of them will kill you. It can be very confusing and deadly for us to try to determine what is good based on what we see. That, oh, that looks good. That's often the beginning of where we make mistakes. That looks good. That looks really good. Well, I don't even need to, to seek out God's will or see what God says about it or seek him in any way because it looks good. How can it be bad? We can't determine what is good for us based on what looks good. It has to be based on the voice of the shepherd. So to prevent these sheep from eating these plants, 
the shepherd goes over the entire range to get rid of them. And do you know how David would have eliminated any poisonous flowers? Roundup. Roundup. Takes out everything. Um, no, he would have had to pick them one by one. He would have had to go around and pick these flowers one by one to prepare it for the sheep, to remove the danger, right? But even when he's there, even after he's there and he's brought the flock to the tablelands and it's beautiful and things are good, he would still have kept an eye out looking for one to grow back, looking for something to grow back. And so he's always, always, always keeping his eyes open, looking out for the welfare of the flock that are in his care. And I hope you're catching the parallels here for how God goes before us, preparing the way for us. Because like sheep, we feel that we have to try everything that comes our way, right? And sometimes we think, oh, a beautiful flower. And so you could be like, God put this flower here for me, and I know that because it's beautiful, right? It's beautiful, and God must have given me this thing because, because it's a beautiful thing. And we, ha- we have to taste this and taste that, sampling every little thing just to see if we like the taste, right? Just to see if we l- like the taste of, of sin over and over. We- and we may very well know or may have heard that this is deadly. Hey, don't try that. It's not going to end well. If you have kids, you know what it's like. Hey, don't do that. Don't do that. It's not going to end well. Oh, you got hurt. Well, whose fault is that? It's your fault, right? The other day, uh, uh, Ivy, um, and she's still young enough to not know I'm talking about her, so I can use her name. She, like, Daisy had already mopped, and um, she comes out, and she starts mopping. And I was like, Ivy, don't mop the floors. Stop mopping the floors. You don't know what you're doing. Okay, and she keeps mopping, and I'm like, Ivy, stop doing that. Stop mopping the floors. Like, they're almost dry. We have kids over. People are running around. Don't, don't mop the floors. It's the only time I will ever shout to someone, don't mop the floors. <laughs> and so she kind of keeps going a little bit, and then I get up, and I'm like, you know, I snatch the mop from her. And, oh, never mind. <laughs> I was going to be like, and I was like, no. Um, and I put up. I was like, Ivy, what did I tell you? So two minutes later... She's running through the, through the thing, slides, and like, bam, five feet, slides. And I went over, and I leaned over her, and I laughed. No, I'm just kidding. And, I, you know, as a parent, you're always like, oh, baby. But I was like, I told you. I told you. I told you not to do this because I knew this would happen, but you just had to do it. You just had to disobey me, not knowing that I was telling you not to do it for a reason. And then, and then sure enough, you did it anyway, and what happened? Right? And, and this happens all the time. Like, we know where things lead. We know where things lead. Time and time again, we've seen other people make that mistake. We've, we may have seen our parents make that mistake. We may have seen our friends or our siblings make that mistake. And we know where it leads, but somehow we think, like, mm, maybe not me, though. I'm just going to give it a whirl. I think, I think I've got a better head on my shoulders than that person, right? I think I make better decisions. I'm going to, I think I'm going to do it. And we see many people. Even Christians, Christian leaders, men of God, pastors, worship leaders eat of the deadly poisons of sin while they're on the mountaintop. We've seen a lot of it right now. Just turn on the news. You see any pastor or or huge Christian leader who's on the mountaintop and then all of a sudden they eat of that poisonous plant that every other pastor has eaten of. And you're like, didn't you know? Didn't you know how this was going to turn out? We all knew how this was going to turn out, right? It, we all knew, but had to try it anyway. God has given us his word to guide us. He, he's given us those, and listen, he's given us those who have walked with him longer and know his voice. If you're going to make a decision, and it goes against the counsel of the Bible, and it goes against the counsel of several different people who you consider to know God very well, then it may not be of God. It's most likely a poison, a beautiful, beautiful poison, but still a poison. But somehow we think, well, it's not going to happen to me. It's not going to happen to me. Maybe to you, 
but, but things are going to work out differently for me. Who's had that thought? Especially, like, the, the older you get, the more you get, like, hmm. But, but youth just makes you feel like, well, that might have happened to you. <laughs> but I'm not you. I'm better than you. We don't say that aloud, but we just kind of think, like, I won't make that same mistake. You know, I, I, I don't need to hear, heed the warning, right? And this is the thing. We have to try it. We just have to try it. That flower is so beautiful. Maybe the shepherd is wrong. Maybe the shepherd doesn't know what he's talking about. But here's the thing. God has given us everything we need. On the mountain, there is provision. There is plenty to eat. Everything we could possibly need to survive and live and live well. Right? And get life abundantly, but there is one little flower. There's always one tree that he says not to eat from. There's always one tree that he says not to eat from. Working, working in psych, I, I've watched people lose their minds from, from drug use. And it's funny because I, I grew up um, doing a ton of drugs, and people would always say, um, you know, teachers and like there was like some drug programs in school and they would be like, you can do this and you could go crazy or you could do this. Sorry, I grew up in Hayesville, North Carolina. I'm always throwing a, a country accent on it, but that's what my teacher sounded like. And they were like, and this could happen to you. And you're like, oh, that's not going to happen. That is so stupid. Like you don't even know. Have you ever tried drugs? You don't even know. OK, <laughs> don't even knock it till you've tried it. You're not one of us. You know what I mean? But I but I've seen like. Many of my friends in high school or college after died um, in car accidents, overdoses from drugs. So they were right, I guess. <laughs> right? I saw in, in, in the psych ward, I saw a girl who smoked weed one time, just one time. And she lost her mind. She came in, and, and like I watched as her family came and visited her every day, kind of like waiting for this sign of, of the girl. And like it just like, Never came back. And you were just like, and I, and I was a Christian at that point, so I was like, huh, they were right. They were right. I remember, uh, I remember one kid, um, we knew him over a course of, some, some people come in and then they, they leave and they're good. They come in one time. Some people come in over and over and over again and you know them well. You know, they walk in, you're like, Michael, I'm like Nathan, you know, and you're like, I'm glad to see you. I'm also not glad to see you. Like, it's nice to see your face, but not here, you know? And this kid, um, Michael, um, that's what we'll call him, because HIPAA, even though I'm not giving the last name. Um, and I developed a pretty good relationship with Michael over the years, because he came very often. Um, and he was a nice kid, and he was a smart kid, and I really liked him. Um, and he was, like, doing, it was, like, back when, like, don't try this at home. Um, but he was, I'm going to tell you real quick how to cook meth. No. Um, <laughs> He, he kept on, like, he, he was into this cough syrup thing. And that's like everyone was doing it at the time, like cough syrup. And every time he came back, he was a little bit less Michael. He's a little bit less there, a little bit less himself. And we kept telling him, man, Michael. And, you know, as a former druggie, I had to be like, listen, Michael, I know you don't think I know what I'm talking about. Listen, I know you, you think that I, like, listen, I've done the cough syrup thing, okay? Like, listen, okay? I don't know why you would do that. That was awful. But, like, listen to me. Listen to me. This is not good. This is not good. I'm watching. Every time that you come in, I'm watching your mind be a little bit less there than it was the last time. I, I'm, I'm telling I'm not just warning you, like, blindly. I'm seeing effects. Michael, you've got to stop doing this. You've got to stop. And, and, and slowly but surely, he just kept coming back. I kept warning him until, and I watched him. It was, it was the saddest thing. I think of all the stories, and there are a lot of really sad stories in a psych unit with adolescents. Of all the stories, it is probably the saddest one to me because it happened so slowly with so many warnings, yet he continued. Um, I watched him, this kid that I cared for, slowly lose his mind on something that was avoidable. So he would, uh, n near the end, he, uh, when he came into the hospital, he started like hearing voices, and at night, we just knew we were gonna have an episode with Michael, and he would like start screaming and come running out of his room, and we had these like motion alarms, and the alarms would go off, and that would just set him off more, and he'd be like freaking out, and like, um, and I could just come up and I'd grab his shoulders and I'd be like, Michael, Michael, 
Michael, Michael. And he finally, like, look, and we could lock eyes, and I'd be like, it's Nathan, it's Nathan. Look at me, it's Nathan. And he would go, oh, oh, Nathan. Oh, it's you, it's you. And I'd be like, yeah, man, it's okay. It's okay, it's me. You're at the hospital. He, like, knew where he was. There was, like, this measure of safety. But the last time I saw him, same thing, run screaming out, hearing voices, alarms are going off. I go and I grab him, and I'm just like, Michael, Michael, look at me. Look at me, look at me, look at me. It's Nathan, it's Nathan. It's me, it's Nathan. And he looked at me, and he didn't know who I was. And he started screaming again. And he never knew who I was again. I could never calm him down. I was, I was like a stranger. And we watched it happen slowly, telling him, man, don't do this. Don't do this. But you know why he just had to do it? Why he just had to do it? Because other people were doing it. He knew it was bad. And it's not that the flower, it's not that the cough syrup was pretty. It's that the relationships he could have because of this. The friendships he could have because of this. The acceptance he could have because of this. Because of this. And that is why he just wanted to do what his friends were doing. Right? And it cost him. It cost him everything. And you might think, well, this is an extreme example. I'm not going to be doing that. Okay? I'm not going to be doing that. I know that that's, that's a mistake. I, I, I won't do that. But we all have temptations. Every single one of us has a temptation that rears its head. And God's removed the, the, the white flowers, the poisons, the toxins. But sure enough, if we're looking, if we stray from the shepherd and we look, we can find one little flower growing. Right? The devil knows what our taste buds want, the fruit. He knows the tree that we want to eat that God has said no to, right? What, what will catch our attention? And it's often the same temptation over and over again, pulling us in, telling us, hey, this holds no danger. This sin holds no danger. It's fine. This is, this is going to be just fine. And eventually, if we are far from the shepherd... Because you know if a sheep is standing near the shepherd, the shepherd will be like, no, 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 and grab it. Just like with a child when they're about to, like, grab a roach and put it in their mouth or, you know, you're just like, ah, you know, and you start freaking out. And you're like, get that out of there. Does that never happen to you? I see some faces. No? Well, if it ever does, um, you, should, you should act quickly because <laughs> it's gross getting it out of the teeth. Like, it gets caught. Mm. I'm going to keep going. Who's hungry? Let's break for lunch. So, but the, look, there, there are dangers. And this isn't the only danger, this, this flower. But the shepherd, Jesus, just in case we miss the analogy, he has a keen eye. And he prepares for this eventuality that the sheep will be attacked to keep them from being slaughtered. But it is an eventuality that you will be attacked. It says in his word, in 1 Peter 5, 8, it says, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Walks around like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. And in Job 1, 7, it said, The Lord said to Satan, Where have you come from? And Satan answered the Lord, From roaming throughout the earth, going back and forth on it. Doing what? Why is he roaming the earth? He's seeking whom he may devour. Not just taste, but devour. Sin is not there, but for a moment. The intention of sin, the intention of the enemy is to devour you, devour you completely. There's no such thing as sin without consequences. In the text, it says he walks like a roaring lion. And in the original text, the word that is used for roaring is used to describe the cries of wild beasts when ravenous with hunger. Ravenous is to be eager with an unappeasable appetite. 
And the Greek word used for devour means literally to drink down, to drink down. That sounds like he is out for blood, to drink down. He wants to destroy everything, everything you are, everything you have. And do you know why? Because you are God's. And he hates God and he hates you. But he cannot destroy you because you are God's. I actually saw a video, um, and I wish I could show you the short segment. But in this video, uh, they're following around a flock and a shepherd, and they catch this wolf that, like, with the camera, and I was like, not nah, anything. And the wolf is coming down, and, and he's like kind of stalking the sheep. And then all of a sudden, he, he stops, and he's like, And he turns around and runs off. And they explain what happened was the wind shifted and he caught the scent of the shepherd. He caught the scent of their protector. And he ran off. Because he knew it's not going to happen this day. It's not going to happen this day because the shepherd is there and he's watching. And it will end up in my defeat because he is there. I can smell it. I can smell him. I can smell the danger of the shepherd. And the, and the predator was so fearful of the scent of the shepherd that he, as ravenous as he was, he ran off still knowing nothing could be done that day to attack the sheep because the shepherd was in the field. Because the shepherd was in the field. They had the scent of the shepherd on them. Do we, as Christians, do we stick close enough to the shepherd that we have the scent of the shepherd on us? That we have his scent on us? Because when we are his, we smell like the blood of the lamb. We smell like the blood of the lamb. You see this idea of a spread out meal, a table land that he's preparing for us, and it depicts something that he's preparing. He is like the host of the event. He is hosting us there. Whether where you're talking about him being a shepherd on the tablelands or setting a real meal on a table, he is the host of this meal. We are his guests. And in Israel, if you hosted someone at your house for a meal, you became their protector. We saw several times in Genesis when people came to attack people that were inside the house and the host came out and said, no, 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 don't, don't, don't attack these men. Instead, I'll give you this. I'll give you this. And they were like, the things he was offering were like preposterous to us. We were like, why would you give that? Why would you do that? And it was because he, he had taken these people into his house. He had fed them. He was their protector and he would protect them at all costs. It was his responsibility to care for their safety when they were in his house. But also the host took responsibility for the provision for those within the house. And we see Jesus do the same. When Jesus does his first miracle, turning water to wine, we often focus on, well, he was just doing something that just showed that he cares about the small things. He cared about those people. He cared about their hearts. And that's true. And that's true. But I think he's showing us that at a banquet where the Lord is, there will always be provision. When I am present at the banquet, there is no running out. Hear me. And know this, when I am here, when you see me at a banquet, when I am there, there is no running out because of his presence. And he still takes great pains. We see it throughout the Bible. We see it now. He takes great pains to continue protecting and providing our Savior. He knows every while, every trick, every treachery of the devil. We would be wise to walk closely with the shepherd because it's always the distant sheep. It's always the roamers, the wanderers who are not lost, who get picked off by the predators in one unsuspecting moment, in one unsuspecting moment. Like he prepares a table, but we have to sit at it. You have to sit at it. He doesn't make us sit down. We're not like children. He straps us to the table. We have to sit at the table because he is the only sure place of safety. The only sure place of safety. The enemy will attack in a moment, in one moment. And with sheep, generally, the attackers are gone before a single sheep cries out. 
a predator could sneak into the field and kill sheep, and they're so dumb with fear that they fall silent even as they're killed. And the shepherd will come out and be like, I didn't even hear anything. What happened? And we're the same way. We are the same way. When we start getting caught in a mess, what do we do? We go silent. We keep it to ourselves. We don't bring it to God. We don't bring it before people who know. When we get into a big difficulty, right, we hide. We're too afraid to ask for help. We crumple under our adversary's attack. But Jesus is not like a regular shepherd. He already knows. He already knows. He's walked the same roads we walk now. That's why he came here, to prepare the way to walk, to lead us through the valley of the shadow of death. He's walking somewhere that he's already been. That he is already, already prepared. He knows our sufferings. He's experienced sorrow. He has endured our struggles and grief. He is well acquainted with grief. He is well acquainted with betrayal. He is well acquainted with friends turning their backs on you when you need them most. It's not always apparent to us the personal cost it took for Christ to prepare the table for us. Just as the lonely sheepman who prepares the summer range for his flock shows his sacrifice, he goes by himself. He walks those roads by himself through the valley of the shadow of death by himself. It must be very lonely. But he does this to prepare the way for the sheep. Do we ever think how lonely it must have been for Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane? How lonely Jesus must have felt in Pilate's Hall. And when I'm talking about lonely, I'm talking about lonely because of the absence of relationship of those who were near to him, not the absence of God himself. Of Calvary. It cost our shepherd much to prepare the way. So he is pleased. He is pleased. Listen, he wants us to live the high life on the tablelands. He wants to see us on the mountaintops, to live above our humanity, to walk in holiness, to walk in selflessness, to walk in righteousness, content in his care, trusting in him for protection and provision, being aware of his presence and enjoying his companionship because that's where safety is. That's when we have the scent of the blood of the land on us, when blood of the lamb on us, when we are walking next to him in his presence, enjoying his companionship. And as we stay close to him, we learn over and over again that he is a God that will protect us and bring provision. Protect us and bring provision in everything, in all things. We don't need to worry or fear. We have to continually, and I have to do this myself, continually turn it over to God and say, I'm going to trust you. I'm going to trust you. I cannot do it. I cannot do that. I can't do it on my own. I can't make it on my own. I just cannot do that. I'm trying my hardest. And sometimes we try so hard to make it happen. And sometimes it just takes so long. We may never even realize, just like, I can't do this. I cannot do this. And then we say, finally, I'm going to turn it over to you. And he said, I've always been the God of provision. I was always going to provide. Look look at the table that is set before you. I'll protect you and I'll provide for you. He is a God of provision. And as his people, we need to understand that he is a God who will provide for all of our needs according to his riches and glory. But we have to sit at the table and stay close to the shepherd. Lord, I just thank you. I just thank you for your presence, Lord. I thank you that you walked the lonely road to Calvary, that that you walked that lonely road in Gethsemane, that you stood by yourself as the accusations flew in Pilate's hall, when people who were cheering you on turned around and spit on you the very next day, Lord. And yet you walked that path because you were preparing the way. You were preparing the way for us that we might live a life abundantly, Lord. And you have provided. You have provided for our every need. But still we see other things that we want besides you. And we seek those things. And we think those are the things we need. And we think that will only, that's the thing that will bring me happiness if I only had that. 
And still, you're patient with us, knowing that you have prepared the way, that you have made provision for our lives, for each one of us, Lord. I just pray that you would bring us to a place where we just fully trust you as our protector, that we fully trust you as our provider and set you in your rightful place as Lord over us, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.